As the American Civil War progressed, and it became clear that the Confederacy could not match the industrial output of the Union when it came to ironclads, they instead turned to the nations of Europe that could build such vessels. In the UK, this would include the so-called Laird Rams that would eventually become HMS Scorpion and HMS Wyvern. Spoiler alert, that sale didn't go through. But that wasn't the Confederate States' only attempt. In summer 1863, a Confederate agent showed up in France, looking to order a pair of ironclads there as well. Much like the Laird ships, and indeed CSS Alabama before them, the new vessels would be built without guns and under false names to disguise their intended role and destination. Egypt apparently had come into a huge amount of money, because whilst it was known that the Egyptian navy at the time was looking to purchase ironclads, all of a sudden ships were being built on both sides of the channel that all seemed to be heading Egypt's way. Uh, the two ships in France had been provisionally called Cheops and Sphinx. But in early 1864, a whistleblower provided evidence that the plan was actually very similar to that which had seen CSS Alabama enter service. The ships would be sailed out to sea, ostensibly on their way to their new destination, unarmed. Then they'd meet up with another ship that was carrying the guns, which had been ordered separately. And with the guns added to the ship, it would then be commissioned into the Confederate States Navy. With things now in the open, the French government came under political and public pressure from both sides of the Atlantic and were forced to stop the sale. But since Prussia and Denmark were currently also at war, the shipyard decided to sell a ship each to either side. The ships themselves were somewhat small, just under 1,400 tons, but fairly well equipped, with a maximum 4.7 inches of belt armour and a similar level of turret armour, all backed by well over a foot of teak. The armament consisted of a single 300-pounder or 10-inch rifled muzzle-loading gun in the forward turret and a pair of 70-pounder or 6.4-inch rifled muzzle loaders in the aft turret. That said, calling them turrets is perhaps a slightly misleading statement. They were more like armoured gun houses, because they didn't themselves rotate, with a number of fixed gun ports. The aft turret was actually ovoid rather than circular. And the guns themselves would rotate on pivot and rail mounts inside the quote-unquote turret in order to fire on one of a number of bearings. The aft turret contained the two smaller weapons, but they could only cover one broadside arc each. So the total maximum broadside in theory was two guns. There was of course also the rather obvious ram bow. The ships could reach just under 11 knots, with power being provided by a pair of engines that could get up to just over 1100 indicated horsepower at maximum output, and there was a pair of masts that provided an auxiliary sail rig. The uh, Cheops ended up going to Prussia and would play a minor part in the Franco-Prussian War a few years later, somewhat ironically for a French-built ship, but the Sphinx made it to Denmark before last-minute haggling over the contract led to a breakdown of the actual sail, but the Danes kept the ship anyway. By this point, the ship had been supposed to go to two separate owners, the Confederacy and the Danish Navy, but had not actually seen any service. This was compounded when, in 1865, after the war with Prussia had ended, the Danes sold the ship to the Confederacy anyway, and she became CSS Stonewall, gradually making her way down the English Channel, across the Bay of Biscay, and out into the Atlantic. Union ships arrived to challenge her, but the Union's ocean-going navy consisted of unarmoured vessels, and they ended up declining any engagement with the small ironclad. By May, the ship had reached Cuba and was preparing to make the last leg of its voyage when news came that the war was over and the Confederate States no longer existed. Having now failed to enter service with its owners for a third time and with a now United States Navy flotilla offshore, the ship was briefly sold to Spanish authorities in Cuba, who promptly sold it on to the United States, which sailed her to Washington Naval Yard and to put her in reserve in the winter of 1865 as they weren't entirely sure what to do with her. A couple of years later, her prospective sixth owners, the Japanese, showed up looking to build up the nascent Japanese Navy. This sail went through, and now under the name Kotetsu, the ship set sail 
for the long journey to Japan, where, you guessed it, she once again failed to enter service, this time due to a civil war between the Imperial Court and the Shogunate. The latter having been the ones who'd actually ordered the ship, but also the ones to lose the civil war. And so the ship would now enter Imperial service, technically making the Japanese Emperor the seventh successive owner of the ship. Now, flagship of the actual Imperial Japanese Navy, Kotetsu finally actually got to do something, as it sailed to put down a remnant faction of Tokugawa loyalists who tried to claim independence after losing the main war. Having had one of her smaller guns removed in favour of half a dozen light pieces and a Gatling gun, the ship would fight in two battles. At the Battle of Miyako Bay, the ship was boarded by the rebel steam frigate Kaiten, but managed to clear off the boarding party by using the Gatling gun to sweep its own decks clear. The ship would also lead efforts in the naval element of the Battle of Hakodate, which was a much more closely fought fight that saw the future Admiral Togo taking part aboard one of the other Japanese vessels. But by the end of 1871, despite being less than a decade old, the small ironclad was nonetheless determined to be of little further combat usefulness, thanks to the advances in technology, and renamed Azuma. She was then assigned to various guardship duties, as larger and more modern ironclads were brought into Japanese service. And this would end up being her single longest period of service, as she was eventually decommissioned at the start of 1888, and then scrapped at the end of the following year. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching. If you have a comment or suggestion for a ship to review, let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to comment on the pinned post for dry dock questions.